we've got we've got quite a few folks here. Um, Kurt, thank you once again for doing this free lesson for us. We sure appreciate it. Um, I was saying to everyone before you joined us that you seem to love doing these classes on defense. Why is that? Uh, it's true. Uh, it, it's um, it, it, it's a real challenge, but uh, I, I think the short version of that story is when I decided personally early on in my duplicate career uh, to start emphasizing defense and really work on it, uh, mm -hmm. that was where I almost immediately started to notice how much my results were improving. Right. Um, and, and so it's just always been a, uh, a really in, in some ways, my, my favorite part of the game. And I don't want to do it all the time. It's hard work. It's a grind. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to go through a session of 26 boards and defend on 20 of them. Uh, that's a little taxing. I want to play a few hands and relax and, kick back and be the dummy once in a while too, but. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. But that is that is a great thing that you just said, that just by improving your defense, your game or your results improved so much. Um, and something that you've said to me in the past is, we defend 50%, at least 50% of the time. Um, I've got my being dummy down to a pat. I do that really well. So now I'll work on my defense. So without much further ado, um, Kurt, I'll, I'll get you started off. I'm right here if you need a hand with anything, just holler. Um, and over to you. All right. Thanks so much. And yes, I need all the help I can get. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, that that is our plan uh, for today. Uh, we uh, uh, What we want to do is uh, get into the active defense. And uh, if we can get some slides back up for everybody here, there we go. Uh, I, I want to tell you just a, a little bit about the ongoing series that is kicking off today. Uh, and uh, with some uh, deep brainstorming <laughs> with Bajir, uh, we decided that this series would be called Dynamic Defense and Beyond. And the idea behind that is we're going to talk a lot about defense in the weeks to come. Uh, certainly, it's going to get much of our attention, but we're not going to exclusively do that. We'll probably start off very defense heavy and then uh, and then kind of see how things go. Uh, we will be uh, talking some bidding. We'll be talking some play in the hand uh, in this series of lessons. Uh, but Defense is absolutely going to get most of our attention for the, the reason that really that Antara was just mentioning over the long haul, you're going to be defending half the time. So it's something we might as well get good at because as much as we might enjoy playing the hands, we're not going to get to play them all. And certainly once we get to a bigger sample size where you've played hundreds, if not thousands of hands, uh, you will be defending half the time. So uh, it pays to build competence in that department. Uh, so what I want to get started with today is the active defense, which is one of numerous lines uh, of defense. Uh, and I want to introduce it. I want to talk about what it actually means to go active, and ultimately, how do you know, and you may not know conclusively, but how do you, uh, you know, what clues do you have that will indicate to you that this is the best line of defense for this particular hand? Uh, so that's the plan for today, and uh, by all means, uh, feel free to uh, shoot those questions through uh, on uh, YouTube, and we will try to tackle them uh, as they uh, come in uh, as uh, as best we can here. So an active defense. This is a, it's really one of your most aggressive approaches to defense. And it normally entails either leading an honor or leading from an honor. For example, a length lead, whatever your partnership agreement is, uh, fourth best, third and fifth, you know, whatever you've decided, 
uh, if you're leading from a long suit. And we may think of length leads more in terms of defending no Trump, because it's a very standard thing for us to do when we defend no Trump contracts. And that is attacking or being active uh, to some degree. But when we are defending suit contracts, an active defense may be a little less common, uh, but when it's the right thing to do, it can really pay dividends. So you hear these terms interchangeably, right? And if you hear attacking, that means an active defense. Same thing. Why are we doing it? Why would we take an active approach to our defense? Essentially, we're worried that our winners are going to go away. I mean, you all have had that happen, right? You've been defending a suit contract and you made a lead that seemed like a reasonable lead. Uh, and then come to the end of the hand, you realize, oh, gee, if only I had led a diamond instead of a club. My partner had the ace of diamonds. I had the king of diamonds. I was afraid to lead away from it. And then our diamonds went away, right? So that's really what we're doing. We are trying to uh, take winners that might go away or set up winners that might go away. And by the way, our plan for today is after we kind of get through defining this act of defense, how we do it, how we know when to use it, uh, we are in the second half here of this stream today, going to be heading over to BBO and I will have some example hands uh uh, for us to, to work through. So that's essentially what you're doing. Uh, it's, it's an aggressive attacking style of defense. So a couple of examples for you. Without full auctions here, uh, we're just giving you a contract saying, okay, uh, the final contract is four spades. Uh, so take a look at the hand at the top and it's not much of a hand, but if you were to make an active lead from this hand, what would be your most active lead? It would be, say, the three of hearts, right? Let's say you lead fourth best from your long suits. So you're leading away from a king jack, right? And what are you hoping on this hand? And yes, I joke sometimes, hope is not a strategy at the bridge table. Uh, but hopefully this is not just hope. Hopefully it is a, uh, a well-informed decision. If you could find partner with either the ace or even the queen of hearts, then this is a really good lead, right? If partner has the ace of hearts, you might be able to take some winners right away uh, before they could go away. If partner even has the queen and it's declare who has the ace, well, maybe you knock that ace uh, out and set up king or possibly jack as a winner for you while you can still get in. So a lot of times it's a matter of timing, right? And we may run out of time quickly to take our winners before they go away. So three would be, three of hearts would be a very attacking lead here. In contrast, something like a trump from those three little trumps or a club, 10 of clubs. I mean, that's a very normal looking lead, right? It's the top of a, uh, of a sequence there, 10, nine, eight. That's a more passive, a more safe lead to make. Now, for those of you who continue to do classes with me, we are getting to the passive defense later this month. That is on the agenda soon. Uh, so we'll be talking more about that down the road. The example there on the bottom, king of diamonds is an attacking lead. Now, that is an attacking lead that has an added layer of safety to it because it's a sequence or a, it's a broken sequence, right? We have king, queen, 10. Sure, we'd like to have the jack, but this is a fairly normal lead, especially against uh, a suit contract that we would lead the king from this broken sequence of honors. A heart would presumably also be an attacking style of lead here, right? If you were to lead from the queen of hearts. The nice thing about having a sequence, and if you go back to bridge 101, when you first learn the game, 
well, you know, defense didn't get a lot of attention, did it? But one of the few things you probably heard when you first learned the game was, oh, when when you ask, oh, well, you know, what should I lead? Well, if you have a sequence, lead from your sequence, right? I mean, we all heard that. And it's good advice, but it doesn't really tell the story because, well, we get dealt a lot of hands that have to make an opening lead that don't have a sequence, right? <laughs> so, uh, but the nice thing about these honor sequences is that they they combine active defense with some safety. You know, I wouldn't call it passive. We're leading in honor, so it's an attacking style of lead, uh, but there's more safety to it when you have those touching honors, right? The idea is, you know, we knock out an ace and we set up a king or queen. Uh, and uh, that's kind of what we're dealing with in this situation. Okay. So we want to talk about uh, how this can help us, uh, but also uh, where it could cost us, because I'm not going to paint a picture for you that an attacking lead is always going to work out as you would like. What we are trying to do, what we're hoping to do when we think that this is the proper lead is perhaps this is the only lead to defeat the contract. Or for those of you who are match point players, you know how brutal it is when you let one over tricks slip through and all of a sudden you, you get a, a result you're not real happy with, right? So sometimes it's just about limiting over tricks, right? Maybe we can't beat the contract, uh, but, you know, taking two or three tricks when the rest of the field may be only taking one or two tricks because they didn't make the best lead. So that is really the, the, the benefit, right? And one way, especially in suit contracts, that declares can make losers go away is to take pitches. We talked about this quite a bit for any of you who might have uh, been in the um, the win to draw Trump series we did back in the fall, uh, taking pitches on, uh, say, declare, taking uh, pitches of losers in hand on a long suit in dummy, uh, for example. So we often have these now or never scenarios where if we don't take our tricks early, we might not get them at all. And we'll be glad that we attacked. Now, there is the potential that this won't work out, right? So we have to look at the drawback to an active defense. And that is you might lead away from a king or a queen and it could cost you a trick. You know that feeling, right? I used to hear, it's kind of funny, uh, people would come to me and say something along the lines of, I heard you should never lead away from a king, which is not at all good advice. It's very much situational. Sometimes you absolutely should lead away from a king. Other times you should not because you're helping declare. The same thing leading away from a queen, right? There is always going to be some risk in leading away from an honor that you might be giving Declare a, a trick that they couldn't avoid losing, right? Sometimes you lead away from a king and it turns out that the Declare was going to have to take that finesse, that they couldn't find enough pitches in that suit. And if you had just waited patiently for that finesse, you would have won your king when Declare took the finesse and it failed. So you know, this is not without risk. A lot of times when an attacking defense is in order, though, it's a no-cost proposition. We'll talk about that a little more when we get to the first example hand. So yes, it could work out wonderfully for you. It could also backfire uh, on you on occasion. So. We want to be sure that you're aware of that, that this is 
not without risk. I feel like I probably attack more than most players. And usually I'm glad that I did, but sometimes I'm sorry that I did. Okay, so how do we know when to do this? When should we adopt an active approach to the defense? So what I've provided here are some of the conditions that we would look for. We don't have a lot to go on, right? We see what is in our own hand and we listen, hopefully, carefully to the opponent's auction. And then make a decision. So this first point, what we've termed vigorous bidding by the opponents. How did the auction go? Did the opponents kind of meander along? Was there an invitational bidding sequence? Maybe somebody invited game and their partner sort of hemmed and hawed and perhaps reluctantly bid a game. That's not vigorous bidding. There's a little bit of doubt there. We're not talking about those auctions. We're talking about the confident auctions. A game force is established early, for example. Uh, maybe there's some control bidding. Maybe the opponents are thinking about a slam, even if they don't bid the slam, even if they just stop at game, or maybe they even go as far as asking for aces or key cards and they and they stop short of slam because they realize they shouldn't be there. That's what we mean when we're talking about vigorous bidding. And when the opponents bid with this kind of confidence to a game and possibly even to a slam, this is not a time to be cowardly in our defense. The opponents have a lot of points. They may have the distribution working in their favor. Usually on these auctions, it's a good idea for us to attack. And what you find quite often is that even if it looks for a moment like your lead gave away a trick, in practice, it really did not. I actually had this happen uh, at my local club uh, pretty recently. My opponent's bit a slam. It seemed like it might be kind of a thin slam. And I had a difficult opening lead. I finally led a spade away from the King Jack. And I found my partner with the queen, luckily, to Claire won the ace. And I thought, oh, we have a chance. And it turned out there was no way for us to beat it. And we were never beating it, even if I had blown a trick with my lead, even if my partner had not shown up with the queen and Declare had scored the queen or the 10 or won the trick cheaply, right? And sometimes it looks for a moment like, oh no, I gave away a trick. Uh, but a lot of times that is not the case. Okay, uh, Declare's side suit is breaking. Uh, and when we say breaking, we mean splitting favorably. So let's say the opponents end up in four hearts, but along the way, they bid clubs. We're actually going to see this example uh, shortly. Now, we don't know necessarily how good or how long the club suit is, but we know something in the club suit is going to show up in the dummy when we make our lead. What is our holding in the club suit? Do we have length there? Is their side suit splitting for them? Or is their side suit possibly going bad? Do we have length in that suit? Perhaps to an honor. Do we have shortness in that suit? Where maybe we place some of these clubs in partner's hand? Or do we have three little clubs and we know that good things are going to happen for them in that suit? This is a time to attack. Because a lot of times when the opponents are playing a suit contract, you know, where are their tricks coming from? 
beyond the Trump suit. Well, if they have a good side suit, that's the most likely candidate, isn't it? So that's something we might be able to tell from our own hand. And again, we'll see this here shortly in uh, in our first uh, demo hand. Uh, if there is a long running suit, this third point here, uh, now maybe this is a little less common, uh, but if any of you are familiar with something like uh, the gambling three no treat, uh, treatment, any of you play that? This is where you open three no trump with like a solid seven card minor suit and essentially nothing outside. Right? So you have a source of tricks, right? Now, you don't always stay in three no when that happens. But your partner might leave you in three no looking at the other suits. It's usually pretty easy to tell which suit partner has. And you say, well, you know, partner open three, no, looks like partner's got a, probably a solid club suit over there. And I've got a spade on her and a hard on her and a diamond on her. I don't think we're in big trouble here anywhere. I don't think we have a suit that's wide open. I think we can take nine tricks. I'm going to let partner play three, no, right? That's, that's your gambling three, no. Doesn't come up very often. It's kind of a nice treatment because we don't need a three, no opening to show a strong hand. You know, we have two clubs for that. So, so if we get something like that from the opponents, if you are on opening lead against a gambling three, no, one thing I can tell you is if there is an ace in your hand, that should probably be your lead. You want to get a look at the dummy. You want to get a signal from partner. If you don't take your tricks off the top, you may not get them because we know the opponent's are about to run a big, long suit at us. Uh, and then this last point, kind of a, a, a similar situation, uh, not exactly the same because it's not a guaranteed source of tricks, uh, but if the opponents open a, a high-level preempt, right, and nobody else can get into the auction, we're going to see this hand shortly as well. They open four spades and it goes all pass. This is not a time to crawl into your shell and be a chicken with your lead. This is the time to attack because the declarer has an extremely distributional hand and we may be looking at a now or never situation with some of our tricks and they might go away if we don't take them. So those are your most common conditions where you will want to attack. And so I think with that, uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, bring everybody to the table? Oh, what do we have here? We have some results from a tournament popping up in which I failed miserably. In fact, I failed so miserably, I quit before finishing. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, gl I'm glad that none of you had to see my score in that one. I wasn't doing very well. Bad morning with the robots. All right. Uh, so uh, we're going to check out uh, uh, this uh, first deal here. Uh, if this hand happens to look a little bit familiar to you, it's possible you have seen it. It's one of my uh, it's one of my favorites to use, uh, and in fact, we looked at this hand a few months back in a live stream that we did uh, to address the notion of leading away from a king. So that gives you a little preview, perhaps, of where we're headed. Uh, by the way, uh, for all of our hands today, uh, we're just just for consistency, we're going to have South be the declare. The north hand will be the dummy. And we will be looking at the hands double dummy, as we see here, with uh, with all four uh, hands visible. Down the road a little bit, uh, what I'd like to do in this class series is I, I'd like to be able to give you a little bit of uh, defensive visualization, as I call it, as well, where rather than seeing all four hands, uh, you will see only 
your hand and then of course the dummy when it comes down and have to make defensive decisions without any bias as you would actually do live at the table. Uh, I am going to use a, a two over one method here. Uh, you may or may not play two over one, but uh, long story short here, uh, all we are doing is uh, uh, we've got a game force set up immediately. So this two clubs by North is a game forcing bid, uh, which tends to show a full opening values. And South with a six card heart suit is going to rebid those hearts. North is going to now be able to raise with King Doubleton, knowing that it's an eight card fit. And off to game we go. Okay. So now I can ask you, what would you lead? And of course, if you've gotten to study the hand for a moment, you've probably made your decision. All right, Karen is leading a little diamond. Little diamond would be an attacking lead, would it not? Does anybody have any other leads they would make? Okay, an ace. Florence says we can lead an ace. That would also constitute an attacking lead. Now, if you lead the ace of spades, that is what we sometimes refer to as the ace from space, right? No king behind it. Ace with some small spot cards. That is a highly attacking lead. We essentially have two leads that would constitute active and two leads that would constitute passive. By the way, I should say as well, one, it's really a one in four decision, right? The main decision you have is which suit do you lead? Once you have settled on which suit you're going to lead, the card you lead should be automatic, whatever your partnership agreements are, right? If your length lead is fourth best, lead fourth best. If you play, we lead third and fifth against suits, which is a, a good way to account for uh, if you want to lead from a three card suit, or if it's a four or five card suit, you, know, you lead third from three, third from four, or fifth from five, depending on how many cards you hold in the suit. But yeah, once you settle on the suit, the card you lead should be automatic. If you've got an honor sequence, by all means, lead the top of your sequence. So here, a trump lead would be a very passive lead. That's probably the most passive thing you could do. The club would also be pretty passive uh, because you're not leading away from anything, right? You're not leading an honor or leading from an honor. A diamond or a spade is going to be your most attacking lead. If I choose between one of those attacking leads, I would choose the diamond rather than the spade. Why? Well, the ace of spades might be my guaranteed entry to cash a diamond winner if I can set it up, right? Whereas if I lay down the ace of spades, find out that there's no future in spades and then switch to a diamond, okay, maybe I find partner with the queen of diamonds and knock out declares ace, but now maybe it's too late, right? Because maybe I have already played my ace of spades, which was my only entry to take my diamond winners, right? So the most attacking of all is going to be a diamond. So what happens when we lead a fourth best diamond here? Well, we see a fairly weak diamond holding in dummy. So that's good news. Now, you might worry for a moment, am I giving a trick away? What if Declare has the ace and queen of diamonds and you have led right into the jaws of the diamond suit? Did you give anything away? Did you cost a trick if that is the layout? You probably 
did not. It was probably a no-cost proposition. Why would I say that? Look at that club suit in the dummy. It's only missing the queen. Well, you have the 10. The 10 is relevant, but you also know that the 10 is going to fall in the third round. That is a pretty good club suit. And if you didn't at least try to attack the diamonds here, any diamond losers that Declare has are probably going away on those clubs anyhow, right? And that is really the essence of the attacking defense. Uh, this is where it can be really successful in that even if it looks like you've given a trick away, often you haven't because you weren't going to get your diamond anyhow. All right, so what happens here? Well, you have a good partner. Your partner's better than my partner. My partner probably wouldn't show up with the ace of diamonds. And we didn't even need partner to have the ace. The queen would have been excellent news. The ace, even better. So partner wins the diamond and hopefully returns our suit. And we see here that Declare is stuck, right? I mean, the only thing that East, excuse me, that South could really hope is that East is leading away from the Jack of Diamonds and that if I duck this around to Dummies 10, maybe West will have to play the King because I don't think that it can be right to cover the, the Queen, right? We already know West has the King. If East had Ace and King, the opening play should have been the King, not the Ace. Lowest of touching honors, right? So I'm going to play small here and hope for the best. And the best is not in play because West is able to win the Jack. Probably a good practice here would be go ahead and cash your ace of spades now. We think that third diamond is cashing because we believe Declare has it. But let's go ahead and cash our ace of spades first just to be cautious and then try to cash the third diamond. And there it is. Setting trick right off the top. Took three diamonds and the ace of spades to defeat four hearts. And now there's not really much to do at this point. In fact, we can make this one a pretty quick claim or declare just needs to play a round of Trump here. Make sure that the hearts aren't splitting 5-0, and that is that. So take the rest of the tricks, but down one. What happens if you do something passive? What happens if you lead a heart, for example? Declare's going to win the heart, draw trumps, and play five rounds of clubs, pitching all three diamonds from the south hand. And what happens after that? Give up the ace of spades. Play a spade to the king, force out the ace, and dummy has the queen. That's making six. We're talking about a difference between two over tricks and the contract going set. A three trick swing, all on whether or not we made an attacking lead. Now, do you have to lead a diamond to beat the hand? No, you do have one second chance. If you decided to lay down the ace of spades, I hope you're signaling. By the way, that's going to be another popular topic in dynamic defense and beyond. We will be talking plenty about signaling in the weeks and months to come. I hope your signaling is good because if you lead the ace of spades, I hope that your partner East is giving you a clear signal that he is not a big fan of spades and doesn't have the king and you still have time to find your diamond shift. So you can beat four hearts doing that. But a heart or a club lead or a non-diamond switch at trick two after the ace of spades, too late. You have lost your timing. So that is one way that we can attack. Why don't we do it again? Let's look at a new hand.
All right. So this we mentioned in the last slide. One of the conditions where we should be thinking about going active. I'm going to have South open four spades. Is it a little good for four spades? Maybe, but it's second seat vulnerable and a big preempt can be a little better in this situation at unfavorable vulnerability. I like four spades better than one spade with this hand because I have very little outside. Singleton, king of diamonds. Now, if I had an outside ace, I don't think I'd be opening four spades. I think I'd be opening one spade. But we're going to go with four spades this time. And that is going to put West on lead. Well, what would you lead? We'll ask everybody again. Not just the folks that are here live, by the way, those of you who are watching on replay, consider your lead. Consider the merits of different leads. What is most appealing to you? All right, we've got uh, we've got votes for a small club leading away from a king would very much be an attacking lead. We've got votes for ace of hearts also an attacking lead. A, a diamond to some degree would be attacking. It would not be as powerful an attack. Now you do have a more natural lead in diamonds, right? Top of an interior sequence. Queen 10, 9. Certainly 10 of diamonds looks like a fairly normal lead. But is this a bidding sequence that calls for a normal lead? I'm glad that nobody is voting for a Trump. I'm amazed at times how often I have seen Trump leads against a big preempt. What happens if you lead a Trump? Actually, why don't we go ahead and head down that path for a moment? Because luckily, bridge base teaching tables give us that valuable undo feature, right? Well, what am I going to do if I get a Trump lead? I'm going to say thank you very much, defenders, because I'm going to play my king of diamonds. And notice that I was very careful not to win the first trump and dummy because I need to get back there. And let's say East throws a big heart here, a standard signal for a heart. Now I can play my ace from the dummy and pitch a heart. I could also pitch a club. In any event, one of my losers is going away. So four spades is going to make at this point, isn't it? I'll lose one heart and two clubs, and I'll come to 10 tricks. All right, well, that is not a favorable outcome for the defense. So we better rewind this one. Let's go back to the beginning. All right, let's go with the Ace of Hearts. The Ace of Hearts is our most attacking lead. And as long as it doesn't get roughed by Declare, the nice thing about leading an ace is that we should be on lead again at trick two. Now, we talked on the last hand about, you know, the problems of, you know, we worry about leading ace from space, right? Ace with no king behind it. And... Look, leading the ace of hearts, could something really bad happen for you? Absolutely. What if the king and queen of hearts show up in dummy and declare is void in hearts? That is a possible outcome. <laughs> declare roughs your ace of hearts, crosses to the queen of trump and dummy, and plays the king and queen and sheds two losers. I mean, it, it could be a nightmare, right? So that's why there is more risk to the attacking defense, right? So, and I want you to be aware of that, right? Because, <laughs> yep, invariably, 
You might be playing with one of your partners, maybe one of your partners who wasn't able to join us for the live stream today, and you recognized an attacking situation, and you led a completely justified bear ace, and it got roughed, and it was a disaster, uh, and your partner said, what were you thinking? Why would you do that? Why would you lead a bear ace? Look what happened. They made this game with an overtrick. By the way, I give you full license to blame me if that happens, right? Tell them it's my fault. I'm willing to live with that outcome once in a while because an active lead, I think, is going to be right far more often than it's, than it's going to be wrong. Now, you're going to see something about that. This hand is still not a guarantee that everything is going to work out uh, because it's a little tricky. Um, now, partner's going to say they like hearts, right? I'm going to use a standard signal. We can probably afford the 10 here. Yes, I know Jack 9 fourth are in the dummy, but we figure Declare doesn't have more than a couple of hearts, most likely. This is a good time, by the way, for those of you who like upside down carding. Upside down carding a little more comfortable here. I could play the three to encourage. But we are giving an attitude signal. And now partner can continue a heart because we like the lead they've made. What would I do at trick three? I would now lead the ace of clubs. Don't try to cash the heart yet. Because what we want to find out is whether or not partner likes clubs. So I'll use a standard signal here and say, yes, I like clubs. Another thing to keep in mind, a partner led the ace of hearts and a heart. Could that be a doubleton? Does declare have the missing heart and partner is actually roughing? That is a possibility, right? So if partner doesn't have the king, I mean, declare might have the king of clubs. That is possible. If partner doesn't have the king of clubs, then we'll probably get a discouraging signal. And now we can go back to hearts. Since partner said, I like clubs, I'm going to go ahead and continue a club. Now, could this be wrong? Absolutely. What if what if Declare had a singleton club, roughs it, and actually did have another heart? Could it go away? Yes. This is not at all a trivial defense. And even when you make the active lead, you still may not get this right. But if you cash two hearts and two clubs in any order, then you will beat four spades. This is really tough, right? I mean, I would totally understand getting this wrong, even after getting off to an opening lead of a club or a heart, right? You've got to figure out, you're trying to figure out what is cashing here. And on top of that, uh, if Declare did have, say, three little hearts instead of a doubleton, Declare can be a little sneaky with those spot cards and give a bit of a false card that might make things difficult for you. So no guarantee that you'll get this right and beat the contract. But your best chance is to start with an attack. Because if you do something passive like lead a Trump, on this hand, you have given yourself zero chance to beat the hand. So I'll go ahead and get out with a heart here, but Declare has winners to burn now. So we'll go ahead and Claim a down one. Would you have done that? Would you have led a heart on this hand or a club? Either one will work. As long as we don't try to cash the third heart before cashing the ace and king of clubs, we will escape by defeating four spades. And, and this is what gives us trouble about these big preempts. I mean, we know Declare, especially vulnerable, probably has a good eight-card spade suit, right? That's typically what we expect for this opening bid. But the other five cards in Declare's hand, 
complete mystery, right? We don't know. We So there's going to still be a little bit of guesswork at times. All right, I have one more for you today. Now, this is going to be sort of a similar situation. Uh, we're going to have North open with a preemptive three diamonds at favorable vulnerability. So this diamond suit is better than it has to be at these colors. It's a pretty good suit. If you ever play with me as my partner at this vulnerability, don't expect such a good suit. You have been warned. <laughs> and certainly South has a completely justified three no here, right? South has three diamonds, which is important, much better than having like a singleton because South is going to need communication to the dummy, right? And having a few diamonds means that we'll be able to set up dummy's diamond suit, hopefully, and enjoy it, right? Uh, and South has stoppers everywhere, right? Honors in all the side suits, in particular the majors. Certainly after a minor suit preempt, uh, we want to be prepared for the lead of either major because the opponents are quite likely to attack a major suit here. And, uh, you know, South has a nice hand. I mean, this is a hand that presumably would have opened a no trump, right? So I see no reason not to bid three no because I like our chances here as North-South to take nine tricks. So, all right, time to ask everybody, what are you leading against 3-0? You're sitting west. What would you lead without any bias of things that we have talked about thus far? Would you be sleepwalking your way through the defense and leading a fourth best spade? I mean, that is the normal lead, right? If you play fourth, fourth best is what folks most commonly play against no Trump, right? So the four of spades is a totally normal lead. If that's what you want to lead, I can't fault you at all. And it could be the right lead, right? Maybe South doesn't have a double spade stopper. Maybe South spade stopper is a little shakier. Is it not part, uh, possible that partner has the ace of spades and we have a chance to get the spade set up, right? Can we envision the defense going that way? A spade to partner's ace, a spade back to knock out perhaps declares king, and now we have the queen and a bunch of others as long as we get in? It's possible, right? I certainly can't tell you that a spade is wrong. but. Yeah, folks are on to me now. A lot of people now suggesting the ace of clubs. And that may strike you as a bit unusual, right? I mean, how often do we lead aces against no trump? Not that often, right? Normally, we make a length lead. We don't normally uh, lead big honors. Ace, even from ace king, is really not that common of a lead. But what do we know? Why are we thinking of doing something different? Why is the ace of clubs more attractive? And again, remember, ace of clubs, totally normal against a suit contract, right? It's only against no trump that the ace of clubs may seem a little bit off what we would typically do. Why are we doing this different? Because they have a source of tricks, right? We know the dummy is going to show up with a long diamond suit. We don't know if it's solid. They may not have all the diamonds. Partner may have an honor. We hope partner has an honor so that maybe that suit isn't setting up immediately. But the one thing we know is if we attack and we lay down this ace of clubs, we can find out a couple of things at trick one. We'll get a look at the dummy. And we say, okay, well, there's seven diamonds to the ace, queen, jack. If declarer has the king of diamonds, are we beating this hand? Probably not, right? If declarer has the king of diamonds, 
then they will have seven diamond winners for sure. And they only need two outside tricks. And so unless they have uh, somehow decided to bid three no Trump and they're wide open in one of the unbid suits, stuck their neck out and didn't have a stopper in each of the unbid suits, we're probably not beating it, right? So we lead the ace of clubs and we say, okay, well, let's see what partner has to say. Again, I'm going to use standard carding here and give what I think is the biggest card that I can afford. I don't want to throw away the 10. I'm going to play the eight and encourage partner to continue clubs. Now you might say, should East be encouraging? Should East be giving positive attitude for the club suit? Absolutely. It's not like East has a great holding in the majors, right? I mean, Jack of Spades, Queen of Hearts, are you really sure you want partner switching to a major? Probably not. And you have five clubs. If partner has led from ace, king, third as east, don't you know that you're getting in? You can look at that dummy and say, ooh, they're going to take a diamond finesse and it's not going to work. I'm going to win. I'm going to gain the lead, right? So I'm going to tell partner, yes, I like this lead because I have five clubs. And so west can dutifully continue. And now the cat's kind of out of the bag with the jack of clubs falling here. So I'm going to go ahead and clear the suit. Like if you want, you can play your four because you know the queen is the only remaining club. And now does Declare have any path to nine tricks without the king of diamonds being on side? So I'm going to run the 10 and I really hope West has that king because if I give up the lead, I could be in trouble. And the finesse fails. And actually, there's still a chance if clubs were 4-4, four, four, North-South could still make 3-0, no, right? But the club suit is not splitting. And so here's the bad news for Declare. Great news for the defense. And at this stage, gee, we're pitching cards that would have been winners, right? Now I'll go ahead and get out with a spade, but... Declare has tricks to burn at this point. So I think we can put in a claim here for the old down one. You had to attack to beat this game. What happens if you lead a fourth best spade? Well, it's going to go to East Jack. South will win with the Acer King. Take the Diamond Finesse. Lose to the king in east. And if east now says, oh, I think we should be attacking clubs. It's too late, right? Because south still has that club stopper intact. And when east switches a club, all south has to be sure to do is split those honors, right? South just needs to put in the queen or jack, make sure that west wins and is on lead. And now the best west can do is cash the king of clubs to hold this contract to one over trick, right? Now it's a cash out situation and we're not even beating it. We're giving up 10 tricks to North South. So we see here that it really can pay to attack, even in situations where we might not normally do it. And we probably have a second chance, right? If there's a way to beat the hand. What if we lead the ace of clubs? And partner says, no, I don't like it. Okay, well, now try something else. Now switch to a major, right? Maybe it's South who has Queen Jack 10-9 of clubs. And there's no future there. Okay, so then we can try a spade or we can try a heart. Try and figure out what's best. I suspect I would switch to a spade, but I'm not all that optimistic about beating the hand at that point. All right. Well, um, that is it for uh, hands uh, for you today. Uh, and it seems like uh, folks are getting the hang of this. So 
for those joining us next week, and I hope many of you will, we are going to continue on the path of the active defense. We're going to talk about it some more. Uh, we're going to give you some more examples. Uh, and uh, I will even tease you by telling you that there will be at least one slam hand where we will want you to attack next time. So that is the plan. And then, of course, uh, later on, uh, we'll move into the other side. We'll get into the passive defense. So, uh, and Tara, we want to see if anybody has any uh, any burning questions that come through here on the chat. Absolutely. Uh, I'm seeing lots of thank yous for you, Kurt. Thank you very much. Um, hey, folks, the way Kurt works is he loves to get questions from you. He loves for it to be interactive. Uh, thank you for participating so much today. And as Kurt says, we are starting off the series, or today we've started off the series, which is Dynamic Defense and Beyond. Um, so please do sign up. Uh, Kurt and Bajir are offering one more free week to you. And for those of you who join, uh, there's going to be a lesson either live or via replay every single week. Uh, some of the topics that Kurt's talking about are uh, defensive visualization, signaling, passive defense. We'll talk about what what Kurt's going to cover next week, which is also going to be a free class. So please sign up. Uh, it's only $10 per class starting off from um, a week from now. And uh, Bajir and Kurt have also thrown in one extra um, um, present for us. Kurt had done a series called to draw or not to draw in the fall. And I think I see a few of the names here who've been there before, but there are lots who've not been there. So we're offering that series for you uh, for free as well if you join up. So looking forward to seeing you all. Um, Kurt, are there any other parting words from you? Actually, what are we planning to do next week? I'm looking forward to attending. Yeah, more more active defense, and uh, and we'll certainly uh, give a little uh, refresher and reminder uh, next time uh, of the conditions that we're looking for uh, to uh, uh, to make sure that we can start to etch those into our memory, uh, and uh, and we will uh, look at some some more examples, give people uh, more opportunities uh, to. Uh, perhaps use uh, an attacking uh, type of lead, uh, or who knows, maybe I'll even throw people a curve and give them a hand where they shouldn't attack. Uh, uh -huh. So, because, you know, we don't want everybody on uh, on autopilot, right? We don't want you sleepwalking through the defense. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely good. So what I've taken back is active defense works really well if you feel that your tricks might actually disappear. Um, and you gave us four very, very clear uh, reasons why we should use it. Um, and it may not always work, but nothing in life is 100% uh, for sure. So thank you so much, Kurt. Thank you, everyone else. Uh, we hope to see you on LearnBridge online. Um, if you wanted to get any more information on Kurt, um, we've got uh, LearnBridge online with Kurt Saloff, and you can check out Kurt's page as well, also all of the upcoming lessons. Thank you oh, so and by much. the way, I want to I want to thank I, I almost forgot. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, you and Tara for uh, cool. uh, for the outstanding tech support. I need every bit of help I can get there. Uh, and also uh, to Bajir, who is likely sound asleep uh, during this live stream, uh, but for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to connect with all of you. So thanks again. Thank you so much. Take care, guys. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now.